Hey guys, Megalithic Maiden JJ Ainsworth here, and I want to talk to you a bit about the Canaanite Phoenicians and Mesoamerica and how there are a lot of interesting similarities between these different peoples. It's quite interesting. So behind me here is another artifact created by the Olmecs, and it's Monument 19 and it was found at La Venta, which is in Tabasco. And this, of course, is Quetzalcoatl. And he is being carried by this serpent figure that has a crest, but the serpent is no ordinary serpent. Mm -mm. You see, he has a beak, so this means he's part bird. So we have Quetzalcoatl here in the middle wearing a bird mask as well. Now the bird represents air, flying, okay? So this imagery is telling us a lot. Now the serpent, the feathered serpent here, represents water and flight because he is feathered and things with feather generally fly. And another interesting thing here to point out is that Quetzalcoatl is holding one of these bags, these famous things that are found around the world. And I'm writing about this, and it's interesting, but we all want to know what is held in this bag. And I think I might have a little bit of an idea of it, but I'm going to save that for my book, and I hope you guys will be interested to read it. But also here on Quetzalcoatl, if you notice on his back, that's a fin. So here you have Quetzalcoatl, his magic bag being carried by a bird serpent. But Quetzalcoatl himself is wearing a bird mask. So that represents flight again. This is telling us this deity has power over the air. And the fin on his back represents water. So this is telling us that he has power over water. So air and water. So this is really interesting. And I'll include all of this in my book, the final areas of it. But I thought it would be interesting for you guys if I could point that out to you. Now here behind me, I believe this Olmec head was found at San Lorenzo, one of the 17 colossal heads. And the imagery on this is just magnificent. The carving is exquisite. Now there is debate about what these are, who these are, what do these represent? Are they ball players? Are they kings? We just really don't know. Are they priests? But I go into that a little bit in my book as well. But whatever it represents, it's a wonderful work of art. And again, this statue is from San Lorenzo. And the other Olmec head, colossal head, is also from San Lorenzo here. Skill in carving this is quite amazing. This is also from San Lorenzo too. Interesting symbol there on the front. And we can see that the arms were removable and they may have even been adjustable. Maybe moving up and down. We, we, we just don't know, but the Olmecs were extremely ingenious, so. And they also had a lot of Quatrefoils, which is this, or cruciforms, which is a the sacred fire. I know I mention that all the time, but I think it's really important. Here are some of their interesting artifacts. None like this 
anywhere else in Mesoamerica. And here we see the cleft heads, which Dolmecs always, always use. Just zoom in a bit. This guy looking like a little spaceman. That's interesting. So I'll get back to this. So what that represents, this deity here, you see a face, the side profile, but if you look closely there on the top, you see another face. Now, that's a heart. You might be thinking that it doesn't look much like a heart, but in fact, it really does. And I'll give a close comparison for you uh, coming up just so you can see how similar it is from the superior vena cava all the way through the aortas. And I'm not sure, but it does seem so, that the Olmecs may have been doing sacrifices involving the heart of possibly humans, maybe not, but we know like Aztecs continued that. The Olmecs were very interested in the heart and they used it in their symbolism. And you actually, it's, I get dumbstruck sometimes when I go through and I find new artifacts that I haven't seen before because they just keep on blowing my mind. So this deity here, this cleft head, that relates to the heart. So the Olmecs knew something was very special with the heart. And in fact, over here, you see this, the head on this artifact, it's also a cleft. It represents the heart, the aortas coming from it, and also jaguar ears. Now, this figure, this cleft-headed figure, is anthropomorphic. It's got a human-type face, a cleft head, and a that strange mouth. As you can see here, that strange mouth is a representation of the jaguar's mouth, and it is depicted so often on Olmec artifacts. So this cleft head represents ears as well as a heart, layered imagery. They were masters of jade working. As well as stone. And you know, they built pyramids, so probably the first pyramid builders in Mesoamerica. That figure right there is interesting. It looks like the Egyptian Bess god, the protector of women in childbirth. Bess in was a widely worshipped deity across the world and was believed to be the deity of music, merriment, and childbirth, as I mentioned before. His unruly beard, lion's mask, loud instruments, and wild dancing were all thought to drive away evil spirits. He was, as I mentioned, also a protector of couples and pregnant women. He was always shown as a dwarf-like being with his arms too long for his body. And this is what the ancient Egyptians viewed as an imperfect human. And also, many residents of modern Ibiza, which is part of Spain, claim that their island owes its name to the deity. Worship of Bess was brought to the island by Phoenician settlers, whose pantheon had mixed with Egyptians and other cultures. The Phoenicians thus named their colony Ibiza, or the Island of Bess. Here is a really good comparison of a Bess artifact from Dendera in Egypt and one from Mesoamerica with the deity or guy holding a shield with Bess's face on it and here are a few more comparisons of Bess across the world just to give you another 
idea how similar these artifacts are, especially their headdresses. When you combine this fact with all the other aspects that makes these cultures so similar, it's really interesting. And the Phoenicians or Canaanites were excellent seafarers. So we know with their boats, they could travel long, long distances. So humans were ingenious. So I have no doubt that they were able to make it to this continent now. Some artifacts from Veracruz. Oh, these are interesting. These are quite famous. They look like smiling orientals. Quite beautiful. And this is just a mixture of artifacts from Teresa Poets, Vera Cruz, and they are really interesting. In fact, I find this one back here very interesting. This very artifact super. struck me as quite odd because I'd seen some Phoenician Canaanite artifacts, and it really looks like a Phoenician artifact. The hat, the Phrygian style cap, or Phoenician style cap uh, is displayed on the Mesoamerican Olmec artifact. And here is a sculpture of the Phrygian Phoenician hat. Here I'm going to show you examples of three artifacts wearing the Phoenician Phrygian cap. And the top right is Mithras with the interesting cap. And below that is Melkart which was the tutelary god of the Phoenician state of Tyre, and he was a major deity in the Phoenician and Punic pantheons. He was also known as the son of Baal or El, the ruler of the universe, king of the underworld, and protector of the universe. He symbolized the annual cycle of vegetation and was associated with the Phoenician maternal goddess Astarte. Here is just another example of the hat style, and this is from China, uh, from Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China's terracotta army about 200 BC. And the hats are really similar, and also the Chinese were excellent sailors, and they had some really big tidal junk boats that were able to travel really far. Since we're on the topic of headdresses, I'm going to show you a few more comparisons that I find truly fascinating. This is a site called Tula, and these are known as the Atlanteans, and this is in Mexico. And their headdress is a feathered headdress with a band around it, just like the Phoenician Canaanites. And there are so many things like this, but let me show you a closer comparison here, which is quite amazing if we think about it. You might consider that the ancients in Mesoamerica believed that the Quetzalcoatl deity came from across the ocean and brought them knowledge and gifts. Well, what if this Quetzalcoatl actually existed, and it was travelers from abroad, maybe Canaanites, maybe Phoenicians, maybe proto-peoples that we don't even know about yet that were able to share knowledge. Maybe not. Maybe the ancient Mesoamericans traveled there. Maybe there was a place they met up. I'm not sure, but I just find all of this so fascinating. 
it is really amazing and I think you guys should look into it more. Their boats, the Phoenicians were certainly capable of making it this far. We know so much information about the Phoenicians only from other ancient people that wrote about them because the Phoenicians unfortunately mainly wrote on papyrus which was very easily destructible in the heat of the Mediterranean. This artifact resides in Villa Hermosa at the Carlos Pelliger Museum, and it's quite a curious one, as it seems to depict a traveler holding a banner flag and pay attention to his shoes, the upturned, his headdress, he just looks a bit different than everyone else. And the Mayans, who are the descendants of the Olmecs, carried on the headdress-style tradition of their ancestors. When the traveler stone is compared with this portrayal of a Chaldean wearing Phoenician-style clothing, it's just a telling information that perhaps there was influence from an outside culture. Continuing on the same comparison topic, portrayed here is the god Baal, and he was worshipped in many ancient Middle Eastern communities, especially among the Canaanites, who apparently considered him a fertility deity and one of the most important gods in the pantheon. He was also called the Lord of Rain and Dew, the two forms of moisture that were indispensable for fertile soil in Canaan. Now, I want to make clear that the Phoenicians and the Canaanites are the same people. The Canaanites are just the older version, and when it hits a certain point in the timeline of history, the scholars start calling the Canaanites Phoenicians. Let's take a look at the similarities between some of the cultures, the Egyptian, um, the Phoenicians, and even into the USA. And I'm talking about here, you can see the white crown of Upper Egypt and also the Atef crown. When compared with the Oza hat from Washington in USA, those two crowns or hats are extremely similar. They're both knobbed at the top, conical, and they have those side objects, feathers on the Ahab crown, and maybe impressions of that on the Ozette hat. But all, all of the crowns hats here are the conical shape with the knobs at the top. Forgive my humor here. When I saw this artifact, I think it was in Lebanon, maybe Beirut. I couldn't help it but to make this little collage. Right below the artifact we previously were speaking about is another mask that I'm extremely interested in because it has many comparable similarities, which make me focus on the fact that maybe there was an ancient connection between travelers. This is a Phoenician mask that, as you can see, looks just like the other masks from Mesoamerica. And on the right, there's a mask from Mesoamerica with the lines all over the face. And coming up is another Phoenician mask. And I took this photo in Sardinia. I visited the museum there, and it was full of Phoenician artifacts. And we'll just look at a few more. Here is another Phoenician mask. And they are so similar that it makes me question, as I mentioned, what was going on in the past. Did you know that Mexico has its own Egyptian Phoenician style onkros? At Calix Loaca, an ancient site in modern day Toluca, there is just that a very large architectural built object on the ground or surrounded by pyramids. We need to try to figure out why that symbol is there because it is quite a unique one and it was used around the world at many different sites. And even in the US, 
we see traces of the Ankh left behind. There's a site called Caven Rock, Illinois, with a very large Ankh cross carved, and it leads into the entrance of a cave. So there are very many stories of Native Americans that tell of these travelers that came up the rivers bringing their knowledge. So who were these people? I think by now you know who I think it might have been, the Canaanite Phoenicians. The Ankh cross is related to the ancient Canaanite Phoenician deity Tanit, and looking at the image you can see how similar they are because it's a life, a fertility symbol and object. And all across the USA, here are just a few examples, Egypt, Spain, the Phoenician Tanit deity has been left there. It's been marked. And there are some caves, I believe they're called Anubis Caves, that has the carvings, amazingly, all over it. I actually went to Saddleback Canyon in Arkansas and did a large hike to reach one of these Tanit symbols and I found it. The Isis knot, also called the Tet, is also related to the Ankh and it's a symbol of protection. And this symbol is also found in Mesoamerica. I was walking through the National Museum of Anthropology and I noticed that this artifact with that same symbol was there. It was so amazing, and I was so happy to see yet another possible connection of old world civilizations uh, communicating with each other, trading. Some interesting cranial deformation. That's, that's interesting. Probably not. It's always hard when they're behind glass. I guess this figure here is showing perhaps a way that they did the cranial deformations. I'm not sure. In 1884, a researcher called Lortet also found cranial deformation in Phoenician skulls. And he found this out in 1884. At the same museum is an artifact showing the device used to elongate the skulls for the cranial deformation process. I've been to museums all over the world and I've seen a ton of elongated skulls. And not just elongated, but widened, some with clefts, just really sometimes scary looking skulls like this one here from Chiripa in Bolivia. And the museum is out in the middle of nowhere at the site. And it's one of those places where you have to go to the village and find the key holder and get them to walk back up and open it for you. And the museum, we got inside and it was full of these weird, weird skulls. There was no electricity in the museum. It was just really odd, but also wonderful. Explore if you can, guys. It's well worth it. Here are a few more skulls that I saw on some of my adventures, including Mesoamerica, Peru, Bolivia, the Levant. Um, the Levant skull there showing right now 
is actually housed at the Oxford Museum. It's the Ashmolean, and it's really interesting. And here are some more devices used to do the deformation and show some possible outcomes of what skulls may look like after. Now, the Olmec people, they really wanted their heads to be cleft. They were interested in it leading to jaguar ears, the heart, and I spoke about this in the video earlier, but it's just a hard thing for us to imagine today what the ancients were thinking in the past. We just can't fathom it. Here's me visiting a Peru museum that had a whole lot of very cool stuff in it, especially the skulls. And another device for cranial deformation and some more elongated skulls for you to peruse. But when you get to research these ancient peoples and you see what they were up to, it's just quite shocking because you wonder what benefit did it have for elongating the skull? Did they gain something from it? What, what could get them to believe that could help them? And it seems they lived happy, long lives even with the deformation. And these are all Olmec artifacts as well. And you see the crested hats they're wearing there? And that's Crested Here is the Crested Serpent from China to Mesoamerica and in between it was found everywhere. Another interesting thing about Mesoamerican civilizations is that they had a underworld belief as well. And this underworld belief, like the Egyptian belief, they had a guide. For Egypt, it was Anubis. And here in Mexico, the guide was also a dog. We all know that Anubis was like a, a jackal dog. Um, but the particular dog that the Mexicans liked was the hairless. Uh, and here the breed is okay. standing tall and proud, just like Anubis from Egypt. The similarities are hard to deny. Now, it if you compare it side by side, and I'll try to get an image up here for you, you will see that it looks almost exactly like the dog form of Anubis. Quite amazing, really. So here's some interesting stuff. Hatches, and this particular one has a fit print on it. That's interesting. Let's see if I can get this going right. And this one over here, this bird figure, and this back there is probably a Quetzalcoatl. Uh, uh, so 
sorry guys, I just have to stop filming for a minute. I'm going to show you a few more similarities between Mesoamerica and other parts of the world that were supposedly having zero contact with each other. And here's an Olmec statue compared to a statue found in Pakistan. And here, also Olmec statue compared to the Buddha. And I noticed a lot of statues like this that are almost identical relating to the facial features between the Olmec and these Buddha figures. Take a look at a few more comparisons between China and the Olmec of Mesoamerica and see what you think. I think they're a little bit curious as to what's going on, but Anyway, I hope you enjoy the video and I hope you subscribe and hit the bell icon for updates. I have a Facebook and a Patreon, which would help me immensely if you can support me there or just like my videos and share them. Thanks guys, Megalithic Maiden, JJ Answorth. I also host tours to ancient sites around the world to museums and to other interesting places related to cool artifacts, megalithic structures, and generally just ancient mysteries. So if you're interested, if you're interested, go over to www.megalithomania.co.uk.